What's up YouTube? I'm here today in the studio with my buddy Kevin and we're going to learn a little bit about graphic equalizers and take a look at these two particular units that I've purchased from the thrift store near my house. I've got this Audio Source EQ8 Series 2 equalizer that I purchased for $20 and I've got this Yamaha Model GE30. This is actually the one I'm a little bit more interested in because right now I haven't even tested this one. I basically brought it home about a year ago and just set it on a shelf. So I don't even know if this one works, but usually the thrift store gives everything a smoke test before they put it out for sale. So we'll just take a look at both of these today and just kind of briefly discuss what you would use these for, why you need one. Mm -hmm. questions, right? oh, I was about to say, so why do you need an equalizer? Like, like can you just well, like plug it up to a stereo system? Your stereo system may already have some basic equalizer controls built in you're probably familiar with like a bass and treble boost um that's just boosting basically one frequency providing one boost point for the low and one boost point for the high when you engage one of those controls or cut point depending on which way you turn the knob this gives you a little bit more finite control these equalizers are both dual 10 band so you have one frequency band per octave as opposed to a 15 band equalizer which would be a two-third band per octave or a one-third band per octave which would be a dual would be a 31 band equalizer this one gives you 10 specific frequency controls 10 specific points you can boost or cut at and it'll basically the reason it's called a graphic equalizer is because you can approximate a line graph that represents the frequency response so maybe you have some speakers that don't have a lot of bass, you can always boost up the low frequencies with this. Best practice for professional users, typically they recommend cutting frequencies much more commonly than boosting, but I think the average home user is gonna just tend to crank whichever frequencies they want more of. And maybe it's not best practice, but these kind of devices are really intended for the home user just to enhance your music listening experience to make your music kind of sound how you want wouldn't it also be like anything audio related as well as like lectures or whatnot so if you had somebody with like a bass voice when you put up like the lower frequencies yeah you could definitely use this to equalize your speech um you could increase intelligibility mm -hmm. of the speech that way um so it, it is a device with a wide range of applications um Maybe you could use it, maybe in that spoken word, there's a certain frequency that you can attenuate out that makes it sound a little bit easier, more audible to your ears. In the case of this audio source unit, it actually has a spectrum analyzer display built in, and I'll show you that here in a minute. But basically it gives you a visual representation of where the peak levels of the various frequency bands are. So you can see basically where the loudest frequencies are. And this can be helpful for, you know, different applications. Really, with this kind of uh, device being a consumer device, I would say it's more just for fun. It's more just to look cool. It's not something like a, a professional RTA device where you would equalize for a room. For instance, this is more just people like flashing lights with their music. I mean, I know I'm guilty of that. So It's aesthetically pleasing. Just something a little bit more unique about this this particular unit which is I'm sure quite dusty don't know if you guys can see that on video but it's very dusty and control wise though other than the visualizer on this uh, unit right here these two units are pretty similar in the function they accomplish they're just a left and right channel and then 10 frequency center points that you can boost or attenuate for each channel left and right so we're going to talk about the ports in the back as well? Sure. Um, both of these have pretty similar inputs and outputs. The audio source device has an extra pair of video inputs, but functionally they're the same. You also have a tape loop for monitoring uh, recordings that you're making on a cassette tape or really any other device you're recording to. You could monitor what signal is actually going to the device if you have the EQ inserted in that signal chain, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, most users will probably these days use something like this device in between a source unit 
an amplifier, for instance, a computer, a streaming box, something like that. Um, or if they're using it with a receiver, most receivers actually have provisions to insert one of these in the signal chain because the receiver is a source and the amplifier all in one. So you'll be able to patch this in to the receiver itself to apply EQ. Oh, okay. So if you had like an auxiliary cord with a splitter, you could like do left and right, right balance. Exactly. Let's say you're listening to music off your phone, assuming your phone has a headphone jack still or an adapter to use one. Yeah, you could uh, use this to uh, shape the music coming out of your phone, for instance, going to a set of external loudspeakers. And that's really what these devices are all about, is just making your music sound how you want to make it sound. That's cool. All right, so we get into it. Yeah, why don't we uh, take a quick look inside of these and uh, just do a quick uh, comparison between the two. Okay. Um, this isn't going to be a true versus shootout. We're not doing any kind of empirical scientific testing. I mean, this one's $10 as opposed to the $20 one over there, so... I think the difference in size could probably just be attributed to the age of this device. Um, nice. Construction-wise, these both seem to be fairly quality units for being consumer-grade audio units. I mean, they're both pretty heavy for what they are, and equalizers generally don't require that much circuitry that makes them weigh an extreme amount. So I would say just based on the weight alone, both of these units feel like they're more on the quality side of the spectrum as opposed to the cheap side of the spectrum. We got a kitty visitor. Would you like to check this out, kitty? Here's the internals of the two units side by side. This is the audio source on the left and the Yamaha unit on the right. They're both pretty similar. The audio source might have a little bit more construction. It definitely uses more components total, I would say. It definitely has more resistors and capacitors. Both uh, these units appear, at least visually, to be in pretty good working condition, though. I don't see any bulged out capacitors or anything like that that would indicate a problem. The Yamaha unit's definitely in a little bit worse cosmetic condition, and that was just the way it was purchased. One thing I'd like to note is that really this Yamaha certainly seems like they could have made it the same size as the audio source unit. It's mostly empty space up in the box. Perhaps they just wanted to make it physically a little bit larger to match the size of other components in this line, or Maybe they thought psychologically the consumer feels like more square inches is more value for their money. Taking one more kind of quick look around the back of these units at the rear I.O. panels. Both of these units have an unswitched AC outlet on the back, which is going to be pretty much like having a wall outlet on the back of this, although they are limited in the power they can produce, so that's helpful if you're stereo gear is taking up a lot of your outlet space and you wanted to connect something like a clock that stays on all the time. One feature that is absent on the Yamaha, which I'm a little surprised since it seems to be an older unit, is this earth terminal, which is present on this audio source. So if you're using this with a phonograph, for instance, that earth terminal is going to help you eliminate any mains hum that might be present in your signal. But obviously this Yamaha does not include that feature. All right, I've got my little test bench set up configured to test out these two equalizers. Right now I have the audio source EQ8 Series 2 connected. The loudspeakers I'm using are these realistic Nova 5 speakers that have been modified from their stock form somewhat. The receiver is this Onkyo TX8522. It's just a stereo receiver. And then the source I'll be using is this computer down here which just has uh, Ubuntu Linux loaded on it. It's just using like a Acer OEM type motherboard. Really just scrap parts all in this thing. And this is not gonna be scientific. We're just gonna go ahead and do a little side-by-side -side listening test with these equalizers, both in a flat and a EQ curve configuration. See how they sound. All right. We're going to go ahead and test the audio source model EQ8 out with the controls all set flat or as close to flat as I can get them. These sliders don't have a very 
defined center detent point. So you really have to kind of just guess it, that it's exactly at zero, but I don't think it's going to be a big deal at all. I'm going to try and keep the volume level more towards the low side so that hopefully the camera mic will pick up more of what I'm actually hearing, but obviously what you guys are hearing online is not going to equate to what it sounds like in reality. Anyways, enough chit chat. We'll test this one out flat. test the Yamaha unit out now. If you're wondering why I've got this towel sitting on top of my receiver, it's probably not recommended to run it in this configuration for very long because obviously it cools through the top, but this unit is actually missing the little rubber feet and I don't want to scratch up the top of the case of the Onkyo receiver. So I've just got it like this. Um, one other feature that this, um, that this equalizer has that the audio source EQ does not have this one actually has a subsonic filter. I'm not sure what the cutoff frequency is going to be for that, but basically if you're just using this with full range speakers and you didn't want to send extreme low frequency content to those speakers, this would allow you to cut that out. Um, it basically will cut below like a set frequency, commonly 30 hertz, somewhere in there, and um, that can not only protect your loudspeakers, but give you more clarity and the ability to play your speakers at a higher volume without distortion. And really not much else to say, I just think uh, we'll do another test, both flat and with a basic EQ curve set up on this unit and see how it sounds. Also this is the first power on test I've even done of this unit, so hopefully all goes well and I do have the fire extinguisher ready just in case, but something like this really isn't going to cause too much problem I don't think either way. Unlike the audio source, this one also has a master volume control on the front of the unit. Seems to be working good. said really all the useful stuff there is to say about these two units, these two equalizers in front of us today. I want to say thanks to Kevin for being on the show. Thanks, man. Um, we enjoyed having you here. Uh, if you guys like this video, make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below. There'll be plenty more audio and also computer-related videos here in the future. Uh -huh.